afternoon, everybody. It is wonderful that we have more and more light. I was talking with a couple folks and mentioning every Saturday that we come, it's like a little bit brighter and a little bit brighter. And uh, we're almost at that point where we're like half, the, half of the day is light and half the day is dark. And it's just so exciting to see that. So I welcome you all. I thank you for being here. Whether you are here on site or you are at home watching, we're just so happy that you're here to worship with us today. We have many things that are going on in the life of Faith Community Church. You are going to notice that we have a Facebook page, we have a website, we have Instagram, um, we have emails that go out and text, just all kinds of ways that we find to keep in touch with you and let you know the things that are going on. On the back of your bulletin this evening, you're going to find just a few featured items that we wanted to mention. Tomorrow afternoon, after the 10.30 service, we are having our Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Luncheon. Um, it's going to happen at about 12. There's going to be lunch. It is being sponsored by the United Methodist Women, and we have a speaker who is going to come and uh, give a talk called um, The Power of the Unprepared. So everybody is invited. We'd love to have you join us tomorrow, so noon tomorrow. We also are coming up upon Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. It is actually next week. I was doing this with my husband Rick earlier today, and I said, can you believe next weekend is already going to be March 6th? I don't know how that happened, like January and February flew by. But Lent starts next Wednesday, and we are having a service here at 7 p.m. Prior to the service, we are going to be having a potluck dinner. Um, at 6 in the fellowship hall and then 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. We are also bringing back or going to have a special fellowship time next Sunday. So it's been a while since we've really gathered together for fellowship time and we're going to be doing that next weekend in between the services. So down in the fellowship hall we will be set up with coffee and tea and pastries and water and you can feel free to come early if you come to the 1030 service or come um, go in between at like 9.30ish. And even if you don't come to the services, if you're, you're here on the Saturday and you'd like to stop by, the fellowship time is gonna be happening between 9.30 and about 10.20 next Sunday um, morning. And it would be wonderful to come and just get reacquainted with people, maybe make a few new friends. So we would love to see you. We also have our annual Easter egg hunt, which is coming up. <clears throat> we do that on Palm Sunday, which this year is April 10th, and it's going to be at 2 p.m. We have 2,000 eggs that we hide. It is bins and bins of eggs, and we're always looking for people who are willing to donate small individual wrapped candies or small toys that can go into those eggs. And because there are so many, Megan likes to start to collect that as early as possible, giving um, everybody enough time to put those together. So if you're willing to do that, we do have a bin outside. We don't need any more plastic eggs. We just need the fillers that go inside. If you also notice on the back of your bulletin, there is a, a QR, quote, QR code, and that is something that you can scan and it brings you to our prayer request page. So we do have a time of prayer in service, but if you happen to be watching at home, um, or if you happen to have a prayer that happens during the course of the week that you'd like to share with us, this is one way to go ahead and do that. So you just scan it with your phone, brings you to our prayer request form. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, we come before the Lord and join together as we just come together to worship. We take a deep breath and we try to let go of all those things that are going on in our heads, all the business of the week, the business of the weekend, and we just try to settle ourselves. So if you see on the front of your bulletin, we have a call to worship this week. It comes from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Now, if you will, stand and join me in our hymn number 117, O God, our help in ages past.
seated. If you will join me in our unison prayer printed on the back of your bulletin. Heavenly Father, we enter into your presence. Hear our prayers. You are the Lord our God, and you alone are worthy of all our praise. Let your will be done among us. Thank you for setting a path before us. May we remain firmly grounded in your word. Help us to learn the lessons along the way as we press on towards the goal for which you have called us. In the precious name of your son we pray, amen. We always take time in our worship service to remember the fact that we give to God our gifts in tithes and offerings and all of the ways in which we serve. And so we take a moment to remind anyone who's here that you can always make your contribution by either using one of the two offering boxes at the side or the one at, or at the back or one at the side, or you can always go online to faithcommunityma.com. That also is how we make contributions for things like giving through UMCOR. We are asking our congregation for this next week to take time. I had to pick a time, so I'm choosing 9 p.m. for people to set aside at 9 o'clock to be in prayer for Ukraine. The images obviously coming out are devastating and awful. And like with so many things in this world, we can be overwhelmed by what we see. And we've had times in the past where we've called our congregation together for prayer. We're not going to be, at this time, doing something in person, other than we will also be having something during our Ash Wednesday service. But we're just asking every night at 9 o'clock, and we will be sending something out after tomorrow's services also, after we've shared it with everybody. Um, just to take time and just stop and have prayers. We also always get asked that question, what can I do? I can pray, what else can I do? And we like to hold before our congregation that the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, is a wonderful organization. It is um, a top-rated humanitarian relief effort that has very, very little overhead cost, and we cover overhead costs through... Um, an offering once a year that we take in our churches, separate from um, the contributions that are given. And UMCOR has already made arrangements for making sure the contributions will be distributed to those who are already suffering in what could end up being as many as 5 million refugees, which is unimaginable, but that could be the result of this war in the U Ukraine. If you wish to make a contribution, you can always go again to our website and where it says give to Sunday giving, you just change that to give to UMCOR, or you can always make a um, donation again and just write in the memo line, either Ukraine or UMCOR, and then what we do is we send in the money directly from our church. I'd like us just to take a moment and have a prayer for peace in our world and then we will do the rest of our prayer concerns. Let's bow our heads and hearts together. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you that you are a God who sent to us the Prince of Peace. And we know that a core of who we are is to pray for peace in this world. And we pray that prayer often, and now in this situation, we pray for an end of hostilities in the nation of Ukraine. We think of people all over the globe who are not only praying, but are demonstrating and asking for this to end. We pray for safety and security of families. We ask for hearts to be changed. And we pray that in our own lives, we would always do all that we can to be agents of peace. We pray especially for those who are suffering during this time. And we ask that in whatever ways that we can, through our prayers, through our witnessing to peace, through offerings that we make, just lay on our hearts what we can do during times like this. We thank you for your love and your faithfulness to this world. Even at those times when we look and are just, again, dismayed over how 
hostilities take place and how evil can exist. And we pray for safety and security. We pray for an end, an untimely, quick end to these, this war. And we thank you that you're a God who loves and cares for each and every person, no matter what hurt or pain they go through. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We take time and we lift up all of the prayer concerns of our congregation. And again, I invite you each, each day at 9 o'clock just to set your clocks or a timer and just take time and pray. I know we're not the only church who's doing that. I'm sure there are, I've heard of others who are doing something similar. And I think it's important for us to understand the power of God answering prayers. Are there other prayer requests that we'd like to lift up at this time as I make my way through the congregation? Yes. Leela, thank you. We'd like to pray for Nick George. Nick is a college student out in Montana. He fell and he broke his arm. His parents attend our 1030 service. He was scheduled to have surgery, and they found out that the way their insurance works, it doesn't cover surgery from a fall out of state. So they're having to fly him home on Tuesday and get another opinion here in Massachusetts. Nick is a senior in college, and so we pray for Nick George and their family as they get him back here to Plymouth and get his surgery done. No? Other names? Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you that we can come together and worship, and we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you that you care deeply about each and every one of us, and we pray for healing. We pray for those that are on our hearts that you would work in their lives and help us to be the hands and feet of the body of Christ to do what we can. We thank you for an opportunity to, to be together in worship, and although we've had a storm this last week, we thank you that we're on the other side of it, and we see the beautiful sun out, and we're just reminded of your constant care for all of creation. And so as we gather together in worship and we gather to hear your word and have time to sing your praises and to fellowship with each other, we offer to you all of our prayers, including our prayers as we offer our gifts to you in the name of Jesus, remembering that our Savior taught us in our prayers to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I invite us to take a moment as we hear our offertory and make in our hearts our gifts to God.
gracious and loving God, we make our offerings to you this day. We thank you for each gift and each one who's given, and we pray your blessing on all that we do in your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And please remain standing as we sing hymn number 174, His Name is Wonderful. have a Bible app that you like to use, or you have a Bible with you, either here or at home, we are reading today from the book of Philippians. You will find Philippians in the New Testament, and we are reading chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. So Philippians 3, verses 12 through 16. Not that I have already obtained this, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have obtained. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before I begin my message, I will explain the hourglasses. I could say that in early Puritan America... The pastors, I am told, used to have an hourglass, and they would put it up at the beginning of the message. It actually lasted a full hour, I understand, and they were supposed to be able to, if they were worth their salt, be able to preach a message that they had to turn the hourglass over. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a story I've been told. These ones wouldn't be too hard because they're only one minute. This does not mean I'm limiting my messages to one minute. That's not what this comes from. It sort of that reminds me of the story of the little girl who brought a friend of hers to church, and the friend had never been to church, and the little girl's father was the pastor. And so her friend constantly was asking questions like, what are those things? And the pastor's daughter said, oh, those are hymnals. We sing out of them. And then she said, what's that that they're doing? And she said, oh, they're handing out the offering plates so that we can collect money to run the church. She goes, well, what does that mean over there, that paper they're handing out? And, and the other girl said, oh, that's how we know what happens in the service. We call that a bulletin. And then it came time for the, pas the pastor's sermon, and the pastor took his watch off and laid it down on the pulpit, and the friend said, and what does that mean? And the little girl said, absolutely nothing. No, the reason we're handing out the hourglasses is for a different reason. This is about breathe. Our message for two months has been take a breath. When our minds get ourselves fixated on things, we need a break. And we need a positive break. We need to do something that separates us from all of that anxious thoughts and things that we're involved with. So we've tried to talk about different things, taking a walk 
doing poetry. We gave out the finger labyrinth. We had Bob talk to us about making flies for fly fishing and all these different ways, and we have all of them ourselves, these different things that we can do to just breathe, to just have a break. And that's what the hourglass represents. Keep it somewhere so that when things are tense or things are stressful in your life, you can pull it out and you can say, you know what, I'm just going to set this down. Maybe I'm just going to watch it for a minute or I'm going to do something completely different for a minute to just get my brain off of the stuff that consumes us and onto something else. We've tried to say during this time as we've talked about spiritual practices that it's not just self-help, it's then we would be no different than sort of a self-help bookstore that was just giving out good advice, but rather it's making space for the Holy Spirit to do work in our lives. To take that break so that we quit focusing on something else so God can do that renewing in, in our minds. And that's what hopefully this last two months has been about. It's been about getting some focuses on some things that we breathe into our lives because I'm sorry, there is so much negativity and so much division in our world and so much hurt that it can fill us full of so much anxiety and we see it all around. And so we invite you to take your hourglass and at times in your day when things feel stressful or you're obsessing over something, pull it out and do something different for one minute. And just learn to detach. A number of years ago, I took up running and I discovered something important with running. When I go out for a run, I quit thinking about the stuff that bothers me. And then I realized it was my choice whether or not I wanted to take it back. At first, I would. I'd finish my run and I'd start thinking about all the stuff again. And all of a sudden, one day, I thought, this is a gift. If I go out and I exercise and I'm no longer thinking about the negative stuff that had bothered me ahead of time, I'm just going to discipline myself not to take it back. And that has been a very life-giving thing for me. We give you these hourglasses with that same understanding. We come to the end of our sermon series on Just Breathe. What is the stuff that we take into ourselves? And today's is about learning to press on, to keep going. There's times in our life when that's what we need to do, isn't it? We just need to keep going. we got to get through stuff. And we, we have to know that as Christians, we are just going to stay faithful. And I think that what we hear in Paul's letter to the Philippians that we're going to talk a little bit about is how Paul has learned in his own life to continue to press on, and we heard those words in this passage. But first I'd like to tell you about something that happened to me a number of years ago. I like to collect old vinyl records. I like to say I'm not much different than I was when I was about 13 years old when I started my record collection. And a few years ago, I was at Savers here in town, and I saw an album that I always liked, and I remembered it from college, but I didn't own my own copy of it. It was Super Tramp's Breakfast in America, and I bought it for 99 cents. I took it home, and I played it, and it just didn't sound perfect. It was used, and I thought, well, what do you expect? It's from Savers, and it was only 99 cents, so it had some little snaps and pops in it. Then one day I was at Newbury Comics, and Newbury Comics had the same record, so it was now $4.99, and so I decided to buy a second copy, because certainly this would sound better than the first one. So I bought it, and I took it home, and I played it, and it really didn't sound any better than the first one, and it still wasn't perfect. Then one day, now it's closed, but there was a record store downtown. It was called Mars Records, and I was in there talking to Tim, and lo and behold, he had a nice copy of Super Tramp, Breakfast in America, this time it was for $9.99. I bought my third copy, and I thought this one would live up to my expectations. I took it home, and I played it, and it still had little snaps and pops, and it wasn't perfect. Now, I'm with three copies of this record, and I saw it on eBay, and I bid on it. I'm not going to tell you what I bought it for. It was a brand-new, unopened copy. I thought, this will finally be it, and I bought it, and it arrived, it's got the nice sticker on it, it was absolutely sealed, it had never been opened. I opened it up and I put it on and it didn't sound any better than the one I bought from Savers. Perfectionism. When we get going down that road, it is a rabbit hole. It just keeps us going. Expecting that somehow we can get things perfect. 
It really comes down to our expectations at that point. You see, one of the things I like to say is expectations are resentments waiting to happen. If we expect something to be perfect and we expect life to be perfect, it messes with us because it's not going to be any different than a 99-cent record that we buy at Savers. Life and we have our faults and our failures, and they're just going to be part of life. And that's part of what we are going to hear about as we press on in our faith from the Apostle Paul. In 1770, the philosopher Voltaire put it this way. He said, the best is the enemy of the good. Yes, businesses came back, and I think they came out with a book a few years ago, the, you know, the great is the enemy of the good that was based on that idea. But hear that again. When we become preoccupied with the best, having something perfect, something a particular way, it keeps us from just being able to move forward in our life because we start getting preoccupied with what the problems are, and problems are always going to be there in our life. We are not perfect human beings. Which is why I've always loved Paul's writing to the church in Philippi. It's a prison epistle, and Paul is writing to this church that's really a wonderful church, and it's a church that he had started that is located, or was located, in what is modern-day Greece. He describes them in the letter, if you read all through Philippians, and it's a great read. Do that with your hourglass. Just, you know, take it and start your hourglass and start reading some of Philippians. You're going to find out it's just a very positive New Testament letter. He talks about how faithful they are and how generous this church is. In fact, he describes them as the most generous of any congregation that he had the privilege of dealing with. And yet there was one problem that is fascinating that still exists in that church, and you find it in his letter, and that is they lacked satisfaction. We know that because there was infighting. And he talks about these arguments that are happening back and forth, particular between two women in the congregation. And that's what happens, isn't it? If we're not satisfied, we start infighting. We start arguing with somebody. We start trying to force our will on someone. We try to make things the way that we want them to be, rather than learning to be satisfied with how things are. And so, as Paul is writing to them from prison, thanking them and thanking them for their gift, he's also challenging them to press on, to move decisively, to move forward in their lives, and to stop letting the things that distract us and the things that we think need to be different than they are get so in our brain that we miss the good that God is calling us to do right in front of ourselves. The point of today's message is simple. And if I like sometimes to say, you know, a sermon can come down to one point, and I think this is the point. Perfectionism will keep us from confidently moving forward in our life. Hear that? Our perfectionism, our desire to have things perfect, doesn't mean we can't be improving. It doesn't mean we can't be working to see things get better. But if we become preoccupied with never being satisfied until things become perfect, things aren't going to become perfect. And that's what we have in our text. That in order then for us to move forward in our lives, to move forward as imperfect human beings who are sinful and fallen short of the glory of God in a sinful world with all of the problems that are around us and the imperfect people that we have in the church. None of them come to this service, by the way. They all go to the other services. Just I'll get that out of the way. But imperfect people do exist in churches. We have got to stop our perfectionist thinking. It just hurts us. It doesn't mean that we can't care about things improving. But if we become preoccupied in our lives with things having to be perfect, it gets us every time. That's why I love how Paul begins this section. Not that I have already obtained or am already perfect. Remember, that's not Pastor Stan saying that. That's the Apostle Paul. Paul makes it clear that he wasn't perfect. He'd done his best. He'd grown as much as he could as a Christian to that point. He'd sought to be faithful. But in the end, well, things were just what they were. That's helpful for us in our spiritual lives to get to, to be able to accept ourselves where we are. I like to a lot of times when somebody really struggles with something and and comes to me and they're all upset, and I like to say to them, you're exactly where you need to be. 
Because you see, it's our perfectionist thinking that tells us we need to be beyond that. We need to be better than we are today. We need to have more than we have today. We need to have, have done better. And then we go down that whole negative thinking that gets us every time. Paul even knows that things will be better in the future because he says, it's not that I'm all, that he said, I am not already perfect. The word that he's using to describe here is the same word. It's a Greek word, teleos. It's a word that, that we use for telescope. If you think of a telescope, you take a telescope and you can see something out there that you'll eventually get to if you walk to it. And he says, if I, basically, if I look to the future, I know my life is going to be better, but it's still at this moment in life is only where it is. That's why I say it's important for us when we hear a passage like that to remember who's saying it. The Apostle Paul not only was a great early Christian leader, he was a Roman citizen, and so he had a lot to be proud of in his Roman citizenship, and he talks about that. He was also well-educated. He was educated under Gamaliel. He wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else. He started more churches than anyone else in history. By his own acknowledgement, he had a lot of accomplishments that he could be proud of, but he still wasn't perfect. He still was not a person that, I don't know, we don't know all the things. Did he lose his temper? Did he get discouraged? Did he suffer from anxiety? Perfection, perfectionist thinking nails us every time. People look constantly for something out there that's perfect. They even look for a perfect church. Do you know where to, you, you can find a perfect church. Did you know that? They, they do exist. All you have to do is go to a gathering of a whole bunch of clergy and they'll all sit around and they'll either tell you how their church is the worst church in the world or their church is perfect. But everywhere else, churches are just churches. We just are who we are. We do our best. Because perfectionism is really at its core dishonest. It's not being honest about who we are. We can't live up to some sense of somehow having everything in a manner other than what it is. I once heard the story of a person who went to his pastor and said to the pastor, Pastor, I'd like the secret of life. She met with this person week after week, and he kept coming. He goes, I, I just don't get it. I, I just, I, I'm not there yet. I'm just looking for the ultimate secret of life. And finally, one day, she said, okay, go to the public library. Go into the reference room. Against the wall, facing the front desk, there's a bookshelf. Look on the second shelf down and pick up the fifth book from the left. Now turn, uh, hear me clear, turn to page 165. On that page, write down on a piece of paper everything you learn in the second paragraph. Next week, and not before next week, I don't want to talk to you before next week, we'll meet again here in my office at 10.30. If you can study what you learned in that paragraph and you can come back and you can tell me without looking at your paper, you will have discovered the secret of life. The guy leaves, he's all excited, and finally the next week he walks in kind of confused to her office. And the pastor said, did you get the secret of life? And the guy said, all I found was an old baseball almanac from 1996. And the pastor said, yes, but what did you learn? I said, I don't know, it had an article about Ty Cobb. And the pastor said, exactly, and what was Ty Cobb's batting average? And he goes, lifetime batting average, 362? The pastor said, exactly. Ty Cobb, the greatest hitter in the history of baseball, didn't get on base 64.8% of the time. What makes you think you can be any better? <laughs> Paul tells us the same thing. We're not going to be perfect. We can grow, we can have goals, we can move forward, and that's all great. But if we somehow think that we can't learn to be satisfied with where we are right now, it just gets us discouraged. And so Paul, this person, who's the, the person who starts churches, who's willing to go to prison for his faith, who shares more of himself, he gives up everything he can, to be a faithful Christian witness in the first century reminds the church that he's writing his letter to, I'm not perfect. 
Don't set me up on the, on the stage as some saint who's got it all figured out. If we're going to learn to press on, if we're going to learn to go forward in our life, along with understanding we're not perfect, the second thing we need to learn to do is start learning to let go. There are so many things that people hold on to, so many resentments, so many things that we failed in the past, so many things that have bothered us that we wish we would have done different. How many times do we go to a conversation and later we just ream it over in our minds thinking, well, if I had it to do over again, guess what? Right there, we don't. We don't have it to do over again. But if I did, I would say such and such. But we don't. We need to learn to let go. Or we hold on to things that have happened far beyond where we should that's what Paul continues in verse 13. It says, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Those are powerful words. Forgetting what lies behind. This is the gospel message. We may mess up. Christ forgives. We choose to forget our failures and move on. We learn, but we learn to let go. The apostle Paul made mistakes. When I think of his life, and you, you just take an autobiographical look at this guy Paul who's writing this letter... We remember the first time that we meet him in the New Testament. His name is not, at that point, referred to as Paul. It's Saul. And there's a young Christian man named Stephen who's being stoned to death for his faith, and young Saul is standing there giving approval. Then on his first missionary journey, he goes with Barnabas, and they have a young man on that missionary journey with them, and his name is John Mark, and some people think that this is Barnabas' cousin. We're not really sure. And in Acts chapter 13, this young guy who's struggling, we don't know why he's struggling, the Bible doesn't tell us, but he goes back and leaves the missionary journey and goes back to Jerusalem. Story goes on, church continues to move forward, and now it comes time for another missionary journey. And Paul says, I'm not taking John Mark with me again. He gave up on the guy. Barnabas, on the other hand, says, what are, you, are you crazy? Like, that's what we're supposed to do. We give people another chance. Paul says no. And so the two of them split, and they go different directions. Later in his writings, Paul talks about the fact that John Mark is helpful to him. So we make the assumption that Paul has come to the conclusion that he messed up. In his work with this young guy, rather than being understanding, rather than giving him another opportunity, Paul had become negative and judgmental. And now Paul is realizing that He's got stuff in his past that he's not very proud of. Decisions that he wished he wouldn't have made. Don't we all? Isn't that the story of our lives? Every one of us can say that same thing. You know, if I had it to do over again, we don't have it to do over again. And therefore, what Paul tells us to do is to forget the past, to let it go. To Another way to put it is to overlook it, to say, you know, I can learn from it, but I can't keep dwelling on it. The idea is not that it is completely out of our mind, but we quit making it so important. The mistakes of any one of us does not need to define us. The hurts of our past do not need to be the things that we carry with us today and say, this is the only thing of what I am, and yet how many times do we do that as Christians? And so Paul is saying, remember, it's important to learn not only to avoid perfectionist thinking, but to learn to let some things go in our lives. I know we just went through an Olympics that hardly anybody seemed to have watched. I still like the Olympics, so I'll always be the person who watches as many as I can. But I'm wondering, does anybody remember back to the 1972 Olympics? I was a kid, and those were my favorite. And there was some things that happened in that Olympics. That was also the tragic Olympics, where we had the whole terrorist situation with the, nation, with the Israelis who were unfortunately taken captive and eventually killed at the airport in Germany. But during that Olympics, there was also a runner named Lasse Varen. Does anybody remember him? My wife is nodding yes because she's heard the story a million times. She goes, oh, there he goes again, telling about good old Lasse Varen. Lasse Varen in the 1970 Olympics was running the 10,000 meters. Midway through the race, he fell down. Now he was in fifth place. When he stumbled and he got up, he was now way behind everybody. 
He rose quickly and he moved within seconds to 230 meters from the last person. And then he just kept moving forward and forward and forward. With about a lap and a half to go, Lasse Viren made his move. He went out front and one by one he picked off all the other runners. And finally he came in first place, had an exciting finish and won by about six meters. He also broke the world record in that race. Think about that. He fell down in the middle of the race and went from fifth place to way behind everybody. That could have defined his race. At that moment, he could have given up and said, that's it. Instead of being defined by something that happened, he had to literally let it go and start the race over behind everybody, run far more than anyone else ran, and he not only won the Olympics, he set a world record. The Apostle Paul wants us to learn in our lives to avoid perfectionist thinking and to learn to let go some things that just take us down. Sometimes it can be hurts that we have, sometimes it could be disappointments, sometimes it can be things that we just wish we could relive. What it is, is it's not about being in denial, but it's really about accepting the past, about accepting how things are and doing what we have to do. There's times when we need to make amends, there's times when we need to clean up messes, but there's also a time when we just need to learn to move on in our lives. Which gets us to the final thing that's important to do if we're going to press on in our lives and keep going and not be defined by the things that we allow to distract us, and that's we also need to learn to celebrate. Celebration is one of the most important things that we forget to do. We somehow think that if we celebrate that then we're making too much of ourselves, and aren't we supposed to be humble? And we are, but there's also a place in our lives to celebrate the things that we've accomplished and be okay with saying, I feel great about this because it allows us in that celebration to not only realize that God has been faithful and that we've accomplished something, but that we can continue and have more things in front of us. That's why Paul ends this section by saying, let us hold true to what we have attained. He here is referring to the fact that they are followers of Christ. And he's saying, listen, as we look at our lives, let's hold true, let's celebrate to the fact that we're people who have chosen to follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's a pretty major accomplishment in the first century. That wasn't exactly a time where people would get up on Sunday morning and say, should I go to Dunkin' Donuts or should I go to church or should I sleep in? Choosing to be a follower of Christ came with some risk. It's sort of like as we watch what's going on in the Ukraine, the people who are making a choice to fight for their freedom have a right to celebrate the fact that they're choosing to be faithful. But I also was moved as I was watching people in, the, in Russia choosing to demonstrate at risk of their own lives and the rest of their life I hope they can look back and they can celebrate and say, you know what, when it really matters, I did the right thing and I chose to do the right thing. And there's a time to celebrate the decisions that we make and the things that we accomplish. And that's what Paul's saying to them. Let's, let's celebrate what we've already accomplished. Think of a sports team winning a championship. Everyone comes together and celebrates. The Philippian church had chosen to be Christ-like in a hostile environment. Celebrate that. The same thing is true in your life and my life. Let's celebrate our faithfulness. Let's not just be defined by the things that we mess up. Let's celebrate the things we do well. Maybe it's only, you know, I didn't feel like coming and listening to Pastor Stan for half an hour, Babylon about whatever he is going to, but hey, I celebrate, I made it, I did it, I got through it. It's celebrating and accepting the fact that when we learn to do that, we continue to move forward with confidence in our lives. When I work with people who struggle, I always say to them, there's three things to make a change in our life that are necessary. I call them the three C's. Communicate. When you're struggling, tell somebody before you mess up. When you're, if I'm dealing with somebody who's in addiction, I say, before you take that drink, communicate. Call somebody up and say, I'm struggling. Learn to be consistent. Learn to do the things that you do well, and then celebrate. Get to the end of the day, celebrate a day. 
get to a week, celebrate a week. When we learn to do that, our lives stop needing to be perfect and we start being able to move on and we start being able to celebrate the good that God's doing in our lives. One of my favorite American authors is Wallace Stegner. And he wrote a number of books, including Big Rock, Candy Mountain. But always my favorite will be the book Wolf Willow. Now you ask me, why is it your favorite? Because my son David gave it to me when he was about five years old. It was Christmas time, and David knew that I liked Wallace Stegner, so we went with his mom to a bookstore, and they were looking at books, and she was reading the different names. And when he heard the name Wolf Willow, he, gave, he said, that's the one I want to give my dad. I asked him, why did you pick that one out? He goes, I like the name. I'm not going to tell you why it's called Wolf Willow. That's a story for a different day. But in it, it's a very autobiographical book. And at one point, Stegner, who I have a lot in common with because he was raised in the upper Midwest, he spent some time in North Dakota, and then his family, they were homesteaders in Manitoba. Years later, he was a brilliant man who went to Harvard. And when he was at Harvard, he tells in, the, in his book how he got to know these people who had had a completely different life than him. He said he met these people who were wealthy, and they, they were... From Boston and Philadelphia and New York. And he said, here is just this kid from the upper Midwest. And he said, he just couldn't compare with them. And he said, friends started telling me how, oh yeah, in the summer, like we, we go to the continent versus going to England. And he was like, he didn't even know that concept before. And they talked about traveling to the Louvre. And he was just, he said, one day he just started feeling bad about himself until somebody said to him some words that changed his life. And the person said, you know, when I was at the Louvre, you were doing something, weren't you? And all of a sudden he realized, he's like, you're right. You got to go to the Louvre, but I got to go sit in a cornfield and stand out in the Midwest as a kid and look at God's amazing sky in a place where I couldn't see anybody else. And I read that and I was like, that was my life. And he said, it's important to learn to celebrate what we've done and who we are, not who somebody else is and what they've done, but take satisfaction and be excited for what we've accomplished. And those words transformed him, and they helped me come to terms with an awful lot in my life of realizing we don't have to compare ourselves to someone else. We don't have to have somebody else's spiritual journey. We are okay who we are, and God made us to be the people that we are, and it's important to learn to stop trying to be perfectionist, to let go of the things that we hold on to, those resentments and those things that just keep coming and haunting us, and to celebrate the good stuff that's happened, even if it is no more than, and I'm telling you, you've never had the opportunity that I had to be a 10-year-old on a bike out in the middle of the prairie in a cornfield with nobody around, and to just stand there and take it all in. You see, those are things we can all celebrate. What is in your life? We all have it. And learning to live that way is learning to live the way the Apostle Paul teaches us to move on. So what about breakfast in America? Remember, I started my sermon with five copies. I gave away a few. And then I realized that I actually liked the first one I got from Savers. However, I also liked the one that I got from eBay because it had that really cool sticker on it. So what I did is I took my Savers copy and I put it in my new one and I gave away the other four albums. <laughs> and now today, when I'm having a bad day and I want to pull my hourglass out and I want to get myself distracted and quit thinking about the stuff that's bothering me, and I want to have a nice spiritual experience where I can detach and give room for the Holy Spirit in my life, I like to turn on Breakfast in America. It's one of my favorite albums. And a lot of times I go right to the logical song. And there's something about hearing these words. When I was young, it seemed that life was wonderful. A miracle. Oh, it was beautiful. Magical. And the birds and the trees, did all sing happily, joyfully playfully, watching me. Let's learn to breathe. Let's just learn to breathe. Because when we learn to do it, to detach and give it to God, 
It's amazing what God can do in our lives. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, help us to learn to detach especially from the stuff that we compare ourselves to others or we think that somehow because we did something we can just never get over it. Help us realize that the Apostle Paul, who accomplished more than any one of us will ever do in advancing your church, was able to come to the fact that he wasn't perfect. He had to move on from things that he had done wrong. And he'd learned the gift of celebrating what's good. Help us learn to do that in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to join with me in our closing hymn, number 396. I do remind you that on Wednesday we will be having a potluck here at 6 o'clock. Bring your favorite super sandwich to share. And we will be having our Ash Wednesday service in the sanctuary at 7. Let us stand together and sing hymn number 396. As we end our service today, just pray that the Lord would keep us grounded in him and that you would have the peace of the Lord, the peace that surpasses all understanding today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen.